And uh, yes, can you see the screen? Yes, okay. we do. Okay, so and uh, really thank you also for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be part of this uh, 10 year Living Machines edition. And uh, also, I would like to take the occasion to thank uh, Paul, uh, Tony, and uh, Anna for, uh, I mean, the, the great job that you have done in these years in pushing, promoting this uh, completely new conference. Uh, and uh, by the way, I have the, the <laughs> this <bad> book, <laughs> great piece of job. <laughs> thank you also mm -hmm. for this. And uh, so it's a great occasion for me, of course, also to share some of the activity we are performing in the field of bioinspired soft robotics, uh, but in particular also to share the approach that we have in this field. And um, as uh, uh, Tony and uh, also Paul already uh, mentioned in his uh, uh, introduction, uh, uh, this is the approach. So we started from uh, the natural organism and the goal is to translate, in fact, the features, the, the key features into uh, artifact and technology for several applications. And then for us, it's a, among many, uh, it's fundamental exploration, agriculture, environmental monitoring. These are the main application that we have in mind. But also, as they mentioned, uh, the approach is also to use these uh, technologies that are deeply based on natural principle to close the loop back to biology. So this is the idea and using this technology also to validate some hypotheses in the, in the, in the field, I mean, in biology, in the uh, in, in, uh, natural organism. But in fact, uh, this uh, approach we know is quite complex uh, and there are many questions that we have to address. Uh, uh, so uh, there are many challenges, of course, uh, and among many questions, probably one of the first questions that we need to address uh, very simple is the following. So is nature perfect? Uh, of course, we know that uh, natural organisms are in perfect systems uh, and they are the result uh, of uh, uh, an evolutionary process. So there are some features in particular that we, uh, they are relevant to design new robots, especially able to operate in very uh, unstructured environment in dynamically changing condition. And these are in particular the flexibility and plasticity are for sure crucial features to survive. And from an ecological point of view, uh, we can consider also adaptation. So the capability of living organisms to adapt to such environment uh, as a form of intelligence. So how the living organisms can solve and address the complex problems and adapt, as I said, to very uh, extreme uh, uh, condition. Uh, so uh, there are not only uh, not only um, adaptation, but there are other uh, form uh, uh, and other terms of science uh, that we have to consider, like uh, the the concept of uh, adaptation. That was uh, this term was introduced for the first time by uh, these uh, experts uh, in uh, evolution and uh, in biology. So Stephen Gold and uh, Elizabeth Breba in the 1982. And this is quite important because uh, if uh, adaptation is a feature directly crafted for a current utility by natural selection, adaptation is a, a feature coped for a current utility following an origin for a different function or for not function at all. So it's fundamental to consider these differences uh, since uh, we, we have to select the features that we want then to translate into artificial uh, system. Just to give an example, some, a few examples of adaptation. This is a very famous one. Uh, the, the case of uh, uh, the, uh, the panda. Uh, so it's a, it's a very nice example of the imperfection, but also innovative solution. Since, uh, as you know, the birds uh, are usually carnivorous or herbivorous, but the panda is a vegetarian, actually. So its diet is only based on bamboo. But uh, since uh, 
is a, a, a bear region, in a, is a bear, in fact, from a natural point of view. If you look at the panda hand, uh, you can see that is not uh, adapted to old or to uh, grasp bamboo. So this is a, an example of functional cooptation in which um, uh, another um, a, a bone, a wrist bone, uh, so originally um, adapted for moving the wrist, is used by the animal actually to hold the bamboo while eating. So it's exactly an example of functional cooptation. But there are many other example that we can consider just to understand the, the, um, the, the, what is you know, adaptation and uh, um, this approach in nature. This is the case of the African black heron, the Greta desiaca. In this case, the adaptation is uh, uh, given by the, the, the wing of these, uh, of these animals that are a solution for fishing. So the animal, in fact, uh, creates a sort of canopy, uh, a shadow cone, to better identify the fish. And also, very important, the wings are, are an example of adaptation since they develop uh, actually for thermoregulation aims, but then are used to fly. And another example of adaptation, just, uh, of course, there are many, but just th this is very interesting from my side because it is a, an example, an example of evolution without in initial function. So the, the, the case of the scala suteres in mammals, also described by Charles Darwin in the original species, in which uh, he say that uh, it seems that uh, these uh, suteres are a sort of adaptation for aiding parturition in mammals, since uh, in this way, the skull is more flexible and can aid, in fact, to reduce the pain during parturition. But then we can also observe that these skull sutures is, are, also, are also present in birds and reptiles that they have only to escape from a broken egg. So it's evident that uh, it's uh, an evolutionary uh, a solution without initial function that then are used for a very important uh, aim, so parturition. So what is the, the message in this case? So first of all, it's not true that each part performs a function. And so this is fundamental, again, as I said, for us, uh, in order we have to identify the key function and the origin of this key function, then to translate uh, uh, this function into specifications. And also very important, this is part of the design of our system, natural features are strictly related to the environment. So the environment, uh, the influence the effect of the environment and the solution of natural organism as be considered starting from the design phase. This is also very crucial and difficult to, to be implemented. So the, the point is that we don't, cannot simply copy nature, of course, for many reasons, but also because we need to first understand the natural principle. And so our vision is to use uh, exactly the capability, as I mentioned, of living organisms to adapt and act in a structural environment uh, to generate this robot that can also uh, physically and also in terms of behavior adapt and operate in such condition. Uh, so there are uh, several examples that we are taking in consideration from nature, in particular, our model are mainly in uh, invertebrates, uh, uh, soft animals, uh, but also plants. And today I would like just to mention some of the solutions that we have proposed in this, in this year, in these last 10 years, starting from developing growing robots, climbing robots, also soft body structure and solution for uh, energy uh, harvesting. Uh, so, um, the, uh, so uh, in terms of uh, uh, soft body structure, uh, as you know, one of the first model that we uh, start to consider to uh, propose a completely new paradigm in robotics was the, the octopus. So this is still our uh, model in, uh, in soft robotics. Uh, there are many uh, features relevant for developing new robots that are able to uh, adapt, as I said, and change the morphology on the base of the external 
conditions. Uh, they don't have any rigid structure, as you know. And so virtually they can, uh, uh, I mean, they, they have an uh, infinite number of degree of freedom and they can bend the eight arms in any point. So this is also very important from a robotics point of view, but they can squeeze also the body and uh, uh, also elongate passively each arm. So what is also relevant in robotics, they can um, change and control the stiffness of the arm so they can apply stronger forces to the environment. And also they have a high manipulation locomotion capability and a distributed control. So all these features are relevant uh, in robotics as well. And uh, the, one of the secrets is in fact in the arrangement of the muscle so they are muscular hydrostats. Uh, so this means that the volume remains constant during the contraction and they have uh, oblique muscle or longitudinal muscle and uh, uh, um, muscle that uh, allow the, the torsion, in fact, uh, oblique muscle to uh, obtain uh, um, the, the, the torsion of the arm and transverse muscle to obtain uh, the elongation of the arm. So there are, um, thanks to the co-contraction of this muscle, they, as I said, they become uh, stiff and apply stronger force to the environment. But what is the, uh, also another important secret that we are considering in robotics is this uh, distributed control. So probably, and this is uh, quite unknown in biology, um, but probably uh, this is due also to the complexity of the body. So this uh, high uh, flexibility, as I say, the complexity in the, in the morphology. So, and probably just a single brain is not enough to control the complexity of the movement. So most of the neurons, in fact, are distributed in the eight arms. And this is another important lesson that we can take to design our robot and also to consider distributed control when it's needed. So what is our approach? Uh, you can see Laura Margheri, or you know uh, her. And so we started actually by developing very simple tool uh, to quantify uh, some phenomena in the animal, like, uh, for example, the elongation of the, the arm. As I said, uh, this happens by contracting the transverse muscle. And what we measure is that they elongate more than 70% uh, uh, with respect to the rest the position of the arm. And also they can uh, apply stronger forces. So we measure, in fact, uh, the maximum pulling force. We use uh, echography to also investigate in vivo the arrangement of the tissues, the, the muscle, but also the nerve cord that is in the central part of the body of the arm. And uh, it has a sinusoidal arrangement since this uh, tissue is hard with respect to the other tissue. And so to avoid damage when the arm is elongated, this is the arrangement. And we translate, in fact, all these features and many others into artificial specification to design our uh, soft robot. And so just uh, to show you the, the end uh, of this uh, process, uh, this robot that was developed within the Octopus project that was coordinated by Cecilia Lasky, the goal was exactly to develop an, uh, an eight uh, arm uh, octopus like a robot, uh, able to grasp object uh, to move a uh, very important in water since the animal in fact, uh, uses water, exploit the, the, the environment to reduce the uh, complexity in the control. And when we start, the idea was to use this uh, uh, soft robot that is intrinsically safe, uh, especially to explore uh, environment uh, like a deep sea or other kind of uh, um, uh, environment. But then uh, this uh, fact that the arm can change the stiffness uh, is also very useful in medical application to develop a new endoscope that in fact can operate without any damage inside the body. And with my uh, group in IT, we are continuing to investigate a different aspect of octopus. In particular, uh, we are uh, also investigating uh, suckers. So these are very uh, important uh, organisms that they use, the animal uses, in fact, as a fingers to manipulate objects. And uh, um, 
And also, uh, it's a, sí? Hi. Credo che la presentazione non sta andando avanti, che le slide, uh, uh, ecco, adesso sì. Ah, ok, sorry, probably I touched something that was, a... now it's fine? It's fine. <laughs> ok, great, thank you so much. And uh, so as I say that we are investigating also the suckers of this animal that are fundamental because they use as a sort of fingers to manipulate and explore uh, the environment. And they also embed um, sensing properties like chemoreceptor, tactile uh, sensor to, as I say, to explore the external condition. So our, uh, mm, I mean, our idea is uh, again, to use uh, different technologies uh, to uh, investigate the anatomy of this uh, uh, structure of the suckers. So we use histology, micro CT, again, uh, uh, the echography in vivo, and many other uh, techniques. Uh, what we discover is uh, some um, structures never described in literature, like this protuberance that is in the cavity in the acetabulum of the sucker. And it seems to be very important in the process of attachment and detachment of the sucker. And also what we find in the internal part in the internal structure of the sucker are uh, some um, hierarchical hairs that probably also help in uh, maintaining the, the system attached to the, to the ground, but also probably they have a sensing uh, uh, capability. So this uh, investigation is still ongoing. So uh, I, he, again, you can see here the, 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 ultra, um, the ultrasonography uh, evidence in vivo in which we uh, demonstrate the role of the protuberance in the attachment uh, and detachment, as I said, of the, of the sucker. So this is also fundamental and we are implementing the same principle in our artificial devices. But in particular, we use such information uh, uh, taken, uh, as I said, from different techniques like uh, histology, MRI, micro CT, to have uh, our 3D reconstruction of the suckers. And then we use this uh, 3D reconstruction for developing a CAD model of the octopus sucker, and then uh, uh, molding of this, uh, of this sucker. And then we select artificial materials with some mechanical properties that are very close to the natural one. So again, uh, what is fundamental is uh, the interaction of certain morphology of the, of the body with uh, the, the environment. So these suckers uh, uh, work very well in uh, water. And uh, um, very interesting also increasing the number of the growth in the surface in the infundibulum that is uh, the part in contact with, uh, sur with uh, um, surfaces, we can possibly more than 30% increase the adhesion capability of the sucker. So again, the, as I said, the material, the morphology, the interaction with the environment are cru crucial uh, key point that we have to consider also in the artificial part. But also we use this approach uh, uh, for industrial application. So a soft arm like an octopus arm with soft suckers to retrieve objects in a stream environment. So in a wells with oil, high pressures and very narrow environment in which we select some movement of the octopus with the socket to retrieve any kind of objects. So we change, if you want, the paradigm with respect to rigid robots, since it's the robot that can change its morphology to adapt to the external environment. And so we have several solutions based on this approach in the animal kingdom. But as you know, uh, one of the, the, the models that is very interesting for us to push in, in a, a new uh, robotics ability uh, is exactly the, the plant, uh, so the plant kingdom. And so um, recently, I mean, uh, recently, but now uh, most uh, 10 years ago, we start to consider uh, plant uh, as a model in robotics. In particular, what is relevant for us are their capability of movement and perception. And the, the initial idea was to develop a robots, uh, autonomous robots for soil exploration. And plants uh, with their roots 
represent the, the, the organism uh, better adapted to this uh, extreme environment where pressure and friction are very high also in a few centimeters. So they can overcome pressure since they grow at the tip level. So in the, in the part, in the distant part of the root, uh, at the new cell by cell division, and then they absorb water from the environment. And this is a sort of a hydraulic system that push into the soil. They create a network, as you can see, and they explore in a capillary way the, the external uh, uh, environment. They also have a sensing in the tip for perceiving gravity, chemicals, uh, water. They avoid uh, obstacles. And there is uh, this behavior called a tropism. So they can grow following or escaping from environmental stimuli. And so our idea is exactly to translate these features into a robot that move by growing. So the, the, we develop several prototypes starting from the analysis of the anatomy of the, the root. Uh, in, the, in this area, the meristematic region, we have the cell division that I mentioned before, and then the pushing by osmosis, so absorbing water from the environment. So um, we uh, develop uh, uh, such kind of robot that, as I said, it created its own body. Uh, we miniaturize a 3D printed machine inside the head of the robot. So there is a motor that pulls a filament, a thermoplastic material filament from a spool. And then in the head, there are gears that allow the perfect deposition of the new layer in contact with the tip. So in this way, we simulate the growing, the addition of a cell. And then there is a thermoresistor. So this material is heated for a while, for a few seconds, it becomes sticky, and the new layer can adhere to the previous one. And so, as I say, the layer by layer, the robot is able to create its own body. Uh, this is a, a zoom on the head. You can see that the temperature increases for a while, for a few seconds. This is a PLA material. And so the material, as I said, becomes sticky and the direction of growing is given by the sensors integrating the tip for humidity, chemicals, uh, temperature, gravity, and also for uh, tactile sensor to avoid the obstacle. And so um, it's uh, uh, also important uh, to implement a bending capability in the, in the root and the artificial root as in the natural system. In order to bend, they have to deposit more material from one side with respect to the other side. And we are doing the same in our robot by uh, controlling the velocity of the deposition or having a, a two-way plotting direction. In both the cases, uh, we have uh, this uh, differential deposition, differential growing, and so we can obtain a bending. Um, also, um, it's uh, important for us, that, as I said, the application, so we test uh, uh, our system in different soils, uh, in uh, uh, granulate soils that are more controlled, but also in uh, loose soil. Uh, since one of the application of these robots is in the agriculture uh, environment, so we have to detect in the first uh, centimeter of soil temperature and the humidity, and the uh, robot autonomously can uh, send and provide information to the human operators about the contents of this uh, uh, parameter. Um, but also, uh, we are trying to imitate the passive morphological adaptation of the natural roots. This is also very important. So by exploiting the melting properties of the material, the robot is able also to, without any control, to passively adapt the shape to the external environment. In some cases, this could be very useful, again, to reduce the complexity of the control, reducing also the energy needed for the movement. But come back to the uh, initial from by uh, my introduction. So what is a fundamental for us is also using these robots for uh, testing and validating some hypothesis. In this case, uh, we use uh, two uh, identical systems. Uh, one is pushed from the top and the other one is able to grow from the tip to demonstrate, to validate actually uh, why also the natural roots are growing from the tip. Because in this way, 
what we observe is that we obtain a faster penetration, more than 40%, and a lower power consumption, we reduce more than 70%. So even if, of course, it's evident that our robots are not a copy of the natural route, we are not so good as the natural system, but they can also uh, offer, I mean, a new uh, vision and uh, can quantify some phenomena. Uh, since they work, they have some principle of the natural uh, system. So um, growing uh, is uh, uh, one of the, the main options, but we can see that there are many animals in soil. So we are also investigating at worm. And what is the inter interest from our interest in from our point of view is that, uh, uh, as I said, the uh, environment uh, affects the natural solution, as, as uh, we can see also by a comparison of the movement of earthworm in soil and uh, of uh, a natural root. So also in the earthworm, the only part that is pushing in the soil is the, the uh, first, the, the apical region and the first segment of the body, since in this way they reduce the friction during the movement. And this is the internal structure of the earthworm. They uh, have this uh, uh, chelomatic chilo compartment filled with uh, liquid. And so when the transverse muscles are contracted, the body elongates when the longitudinal muscle are contract, the, the, the body reduces the, the, its length. And so we, the animal played with this capability to move, in fact, uh, in soil and pushing using this hydraulic system to, uh, to move in soil. So our idea, this is just the, the first result, is also to develop this peristaltic robot with several modules, segments, and a head. And so we develop the, the, the module, the, the, the core module of this, uh, um, of this system in which we have uh, a, um, a sort of uh, hollow chamber with uh, external uh, braided skin with uh, a special angle that uh, allow the elongation, facilitate, like in the natural system, the elongation, the compression, the contraction of the, uh, of the module, of the segment. So we test both the capability of the module to elongate, to, to be compressed, and we can selectively uh, control each module, and so we, what we can uh, uh, obtain is uh, uh, a forward movement of uh, or of the, the robot of uh, um, a retraction of the robot. And the very important for us is uh, the, um, I mean, the, uh, the um, I'm sorry, it's the um, testing in the granular uh, medium, in fact, uh, for exploring soil. This is the, the final goal. Uh, so climbing uh, uh, robots are another um, uh, feature that we are implementing and uh, uh, by starting from a climbing plant. Uh, these are also very relevant from an artificial point of view. The first uh, classification was proposed again by Char Darwin uh, that uh, um, classify these uh, plants that are quite peculiar since they use most of the energy that they have to grow faster with respect to the other plants towards light. So they don't have a very sophisticated trunk, but they use a different strategies to anchor the body to the external environment. And so we are investigating such capabilities of plants to develop a different system to explore the uh, environment. So we develop a first uh, a new version, the growing robot that in this case has to grow against gravity. And so we implement a several uh, uh, sensing uh, capability to explore um, the environment uh, in air and in uh, structural conditions. Uh, and so what we uh, test uh, is uh, uh, the capability uh, of the, the robot, as I said, uh, to grow against gravity. And so we reduce the dimension of the robot, but also a positive uh, tropism for uh, such kind of robot uh, is the phototropism. So the robot is able to grow uh, towards light, and this is also important uh, for many uh, applications. But at the same time, it's able to implement this uh, twining uh, behavior to sustain the body uh, while uh, the robot is uh, uh, exploring the 
the external environment. Uh, so, um, there are other uh, features uh, uh, that we are investigating, like uh, in, the, in the case of these uh, hook climbers. Uh, such kind of uh, uh, climbing plants use uh, hooks uh, to uh, attach the body. In particular, we are investigating this uh, plant, this uh, galloaparin plant, is a parasitic plant, is uh, an herbaceous plant uh, that use the hooks both on the abaxial, in particular, and the Adaxia surfaces uh, to attach to the to the leaves or the hosting plant to be better exposed to light. So it's a parasitic plant, in fact. And our idea is to investigate the the behavior first of all, but also the structure of such natural hooks to develop artificial hooks for. Uh, developing anchoring uh, uh, systems. So the approach is the, the same. So we start by the acquisition of uh, images and the information also about the uh, mechanical properties, but also the role of the shapes uh, in, the, in the attachment and detachment during the growing of such, uh, of such plant. And then we use uh, this is more morphometric uh, information to develop uh, our CAD model. And then uh, we uh, develop our molding uh, using a uh, uh, 3D laser uh, lithography, the nanoscribe technique. And we develop an uh, array of uh, micro hooks. Um, so um, we test the performance also the single hook and uh, array of hooks on different uh, uh, substrates and different materials uh, and uh, both the natural and the artificial uh, hooks and then we compare the performance. Uh, uh, so we, we can use uh, this uh, system for many different applications just to show you um, one of uh, these, uh, these uh, applications. Here you can see how the artificial hooks are able to attach also on the natural uh, uh, plant. And this is an application in uh, climbing robots. Um, so the idea is uh, to attach this adhesive tape with uh, direction based uh, micro hooks and then test uh, the capability of this mini car to climb over 45 uh, degree inclined plane. Uh, using different tissues, uh, using different materials. And so what we observe is that only when the hooks are present uh, uh, in, the, in the wheels, attached to the wheels of the mini car, the robot is able to climb. And so we have now uh, several ideas, uh, several applications in mind, uh, also in the medical field and uh, in agriculture. But also, again, soft body structure, these are the many solutions that we can take from plants. In particular, I would like to mention these movements that are quite peculiar in plants, since uh, uh, these are movements without metabolism. So when the seeds are released in fact, from, the, from the plants, they use this structure that are in fact dead, so there is no metabolism, but they work and they move thanks to the arrangement of the materials inside the cell wall. And this material can absorb and absorb the water, in particular cellulose tissue. But then there are some microfibrils that depending by the arrangement in the cell wall, they can play for some movements. So you can see there are drilling movement, but also flying movement, explosion, bending, and so on. So we started actually from uh, uh, these uh, uh, features some years ago uh, to develop uh, these uh, plant-inspired hygromorphic actuators. Uh, so we use a soft material like the PWPSS, so that is a material that can absorb and dissolve the water and the PDMS to drive the movement. Since the PDOT is also conductive, we can apply a current to the system by jowl effect, we release the water, and we can control, in fact, the, the movement. So in some way, we can go beyond nature, uh, partially at least, and so we can also control the movement, so we can develop a different shape of this, uh, of this system, of these uh, uh, robots, and uh, we can uh, uh, play both passively and actively. And what is relevant also from an artificial point of view is that uh, this uh, material can play as a 
sensor and actuate at the same time. So again, we can reduce the complexity in the control thanks to the use of such multifunctional materials. But now we want to uh, go beyond uh, such a vision. So we started recently an European project called ICID, in which the goal is uh, actually to take inspiration by this structure. The, you can see some species uh, that we have selected uh, as an example of a drilling seed and flying seed. And so our goal, again, is uh, to investigate the structure, the morphology, the arrangement of the fibers, the interaction with the environment uh, uh, to extract the key features. Uh, here you can just uh, see the, the behavior of the erodium uh, and the pelargonium on the basis of the content of, of uh, humidity in the external uh, environment. So this uh, coiling effect is exactly what we want to implement in our robot as well. And uh, the, uh, the final goal is to create a, such a scenario just to share with you what is the vision in this project. Uh, so the goal is to develop a software robot so with uh, this uh, passive uh, movement capability. Uh, so drilling in soil and flying in air. So then the, the, the robot will be embedded with material that emits a fluorescence when they are interacting with some target parameters like CO2 in air, but also mercury in soil, temperature and so on. And this fluorescence will be ridden by um, a laser beam uh, of a, a fluorescence LiDAR on board of drones. So the, the goal at the end is to have uh, such kind of scenario. So uh, develop a soft robots that are biodegradable and so they can be used also in remote area to uh, detect uh, uh, crucial parameters, so in a very distributed uh, uh, way. And then uh, finally, I would like to mention the, also this research activity that is quite recent in my, in my group. So the idea is uh, to generate uh, energy uh, from uh, the plant leaves, in particular what we observe, and uh, Fabian Mede is the researcher that in particular is performing this investigation. The idea is uh, to uh, stimulate uh, mechanically the, the leaves uh, to generate uh, energy. And this is possible because uh, touching the leaves by using soft material, we generate uh, charges that are compensated by opposite charges inside the leaf, and we can use uh, these energy, these charges to uh, power uh, artificial system. These are the features that we have to consider. This is a, a setup to test the performance. In particular, what we observe is that uh, all the plants can uh, produce energy, of course, in a different way. But uh, what is necessary is the, uh, the contact area, the frequency, the input force, and the material in contact with, uh, with the leaves. And so what we observe, as Sonny, as a is that just with one leaf we can power more than 100 LED and the goal in this direction is to uh, produce uh, generate energy by biohybrid system so trees with natural and artificial leaves move by wind to produce uh, energy and power uh, sensor LED in, uh, in natural uh, condition. But also what you observe, so of course we don't know if this energy generated mechanically uh, by, by the plant uh, um, is used by, by, for some reason by plants. But what we know is that plants uh, communicate also uh, by electrical signal. And so our goal is also to measure this electrical signal by using soft uh, structures, soft tattoo electrodes that can adhere perfectly to the surface of the leaves. And they use, in fact, uh, uh, this uh, action potential uh, to, uh, I mean, three uh, information uh, to uh, communicate uh, also internally but also with other plants and so this uh, structure uh, perfectly adhere as you can see again is our based on p.pss material and so our idea is to use this tattoo to measure for example uh, wooden stimulus uh, this is the experiment on arabidopsis, arabidopsis italiana but also endogenous oscillations and more than this, uh, the idea is also to 
uh, use these electrodes in some way to interact with the plants. So we can also apply voltage by using these ultra, ultra conformable electrodes. And in this case, what the triggering is to close the leaves in a Venus uh, flytrap in a Dionel Mishibula. So if you are interested in this uh, topic uh, on uh, 29 July, uh, Fabian Med uh, is organized uh, this uh, uh, has organized this uh, workshop uh, exactly on plant function, hybrid system, and plant robotics. And to uh, to conclude uh, my talk, because of course we also discuss uh, Tony and uh, also Paul already mentioned the the the, the goal of uh, and the role of robotics also in the future to better understand and nature. This is also our our goal, and this is also part of this project in which the goal is to better understand. The, the rules of the wood wide web, so the communication among plants also mediated by fungi, by this symbiosis between plants, uh, plant roots and, uh, and the fungi that are fundamental also to reduce the, the, the global temperature because they fix CO2. And so uh, it's a fundamental also for the health of the ecosystem. And so our goal is to use robotics to interact in some way to release also substance in the soil to facilitate uh, uh, such uh, uh, symbiosis, so the production of such uh, symbiosis. And finally, uh, in the long-term perspective, uh, this is uh, our vision. So I already mentioned this uh, goal, uh, this idea in I see the project, uh, uh, but uh, and also partially in I would, but th this is the idea that uh, we want to, to address in the future. So we believe that the robotics uh, should be uh, and uh, our robot, soft robot and by inspire uh, robot should be more and more integrated into natural ecosystem. And this means that the robot have to act, operate in the environment, use maybe also the, the environment, the external energy uh, to, to be powered. But at a certain point, they have to disappear because they are biodegradable or reusable. And so this is exactly sustainability. You already mentioned uh, the goal of sustainability. And I believe that robots uh, uh, can help uh, in uh, improving the basic knowledge also of uh, natural uh, ecosystem and natural organism. So I would like to thank my colleagues that work with me. Uh, they come from different countries, uh, different disciplines. So transdisciplinarity is one of the key points of such uh, uh, field. And then of course, all of you for your kind uh, uh, attention. Thank you. I'm sorry for the problem with, uh, with the presentation. Paul, we can't hear you. Okay, Barbara, uh, don't worry about the slide. <clears throat> it was beautiful. So um, it was not disruptive. Um, we, have, we have time for maybe a, a question. I don't know if there are any questions. Um, but now, but Barbara, how do you see the scaling up in terms of performance? Uh, because you also mentioned intelligence, right? So how intelligent are these plant-based systems? What kind of control architecture should we start to think about? Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, um, actually, I think that from a, a biological point of view, uh, plants uh, are a perfect example of distributed intelligence. Uh, since, of course, uh, it's very uh, difficult to promote the concept of intelligence when we talk about plants. Uh, we know they don't have a brain, they don't have a neurons, uh, but intelligent behavior for me is exactly what I said in the beginning. So the capability to adapt and to solve the complex problem, and they can do that. So, uh, But they have distributed the control at the epics uh, uh, level. So our idea is exactly to implement uh, um, such intelligent behavior distributing uh, the control, like now in the growing robot, uh, in the epics, and also implementing emergent behavior, since uh, when you have uh, several of these artificial roots, they can uh, communicate uh, uh, each other, but they also, the control that we implement uh, is based on a phenotyping uh, uh, approach, since uh, the, in plants there are 
priority in following the, the stimuli, the, the environmental stimuli. And this priority continuously changes on the basis of the external condition, but on the basis of the internal need. So our goal is to implement a, such a strategy. We already implement in our robots mm -hmm. such a stra strategy. And with iWood, we want to go beyond the single plant, but implement this distributed intelligence also by using mediated by fungi, for example. So we increase the complexity, having this uh, model, if you want, of uh, artificial intelligence. So the idea is to use, uh, um, I mean, some um, approach based on machine learning and uh, um, approach right. for uh, imitating uh, this behavior. Barbara, um, let, let's let's continue this discussion also at the end of the, the session. Uh, I mean, the second session day where we have our discussion panel. I hope you can join us because there are a few more questions, but being the terrible chairman that I am, we already ran out of time. So um, thank you again very much, Barbara. Thank I you. hope you thank join you us really. for the panel uh, discussion okay. because thank there are you. lots of questions.